Hello, and welcome to the final performance of the eight-week radio workshop. My name is Sherry Allen, the teaching artist. It is winter 2024. All scripts are student-written and student-performed. We hope you enjoy. And now, on with the show. The Incompetent Lieutenant by Eric Quilkey and Catherine Close. The characters are the announcer, played by Anita. The narrator, played by Thomas. Lieutenant Adler, an inept naval officer, played by Craig. I'm the captain. I'm easily frustrated, and I'm the ship's commander. Yeah, played by Lisa. Seaman one, Gomer, a clueless and oblivious crew member, played by Eric. Seaman two, a bumbling crew member, played by Catherine. Every soap girl one, played by Sue. Ivory Stuff Girl 2, played by Susan. The incompetent lieutenant navigates the high seas with chaos, a clueless crew, and our sponsor's promise, promise of cleanliness. This radio play filled with mishaps urges us to embrace the notion that it's perfectly fine to laugh at ourselves even when we're not shining as bright as the rest, like our Lieutenant Adler in this story. And now, the Incompetent Lieutenant, brought to you by our sponsor, Ivory Soap. A naval ship has run aground. Lieutenant Adler is trying to steer the ship back into the water from his chair in the ship's wheelhouse. Nah, damn it, Lieutenant. How in the Sam hell did you manage to run the ship the ground. Is that a pinup of Betty Grapple that you have there? Hmm? Um, oh, oh gosh, Captain, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Huh. Well, for Pete's sake, don't just sit there. Get the ship back in the water. Here you're looking at a court martial. Uh, I'm trying my best, Captain. Oh, oh no, we've run aground. Well, try harder, you nincompoop. Uh, uh, there goes the hull, Captain. Do you think we should get out and uh, uh, push? Duh, you incompetent fool. A court martial is too good for you. Uh, and now, time for a station break. Uh, ivory soap is not only wonderful for your hands and your baby's bottom, but also for your dishes and clothes. Hi, Gail. I hope you don't mind me dropping by. My hands, oh, I was doing the lunch dishes, and my hands are a mess. Any suggestions? Oh, I know. That's why I switched to ivory soap. Just go into the baby's nursery and grab a bar. It's great for your dishes and great for your hands, too. That's right. Ivory soap works for your household needs, and just one week later, your hands can have that ivory look. Now, back to the incompetent lieutenant. If you recall, before our station break, the ship had just run aground, and now the two bumbling seamen burst onto the bridge to see what is happening. <laughs> Hey, Cap Captain, what's going on? Oh, my head's pounding. Well, the ship's run aground, and Lieutenant Adler here is not is steering us into oblivion. Oblivion? I, I thought we were just out for a Denny pleasure cruise to a... Uh, uh... Oahu? What in the devil are you talking about? I can't remember anything after that third round of drinks. <laughs> oh, third round. Oh, that, that explains my headache. And hey, what's this I found here? 
Well, what is it? Well, 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 if it ain't a crumpled up pinup of Betty Gravel, what's our lieutenant doing with this on the bridge of a ship? <laughs> well, maybe he thought it was a navigation chart. <laughs> I know he's no drugstore cowboy. He has to be a lieutenant to feel like he's the big guy. <laughs> hey. Did you hear that? Hey, Adler, get those men to help you dig us out of the sandbar. Yeah, well, sure thing, Captain. Uh, grab those tools, man. Lieutenant, why, why don't you join us? Digging is good exercise. Ex exercise? Oh, no, I prefer exercising my brain and not my muscles. <laughs> oh, I think the ship's enjoying this a lot more than we are. <laughs> Less talking men and more digging. <clears throat> man, man overboard. Oof. Yeah, Captain, I think I'm going to be sea seasick on dry land. <laughs> well, at least I'm enjoying the show. <sighs> Lieutenant, you're in charge here. Get the ship moving, you bloody moron. Aye, aye, Captain. Maybe I should have stuck to Peter Boats. I think we got her free, Captain. Yeah, about time, Lieutenant. Now. Avoid any more mishaps, or I'll personally hand you over for a court martial. Ugh, ugh. Can we can we at least stop for a drink first? I need to settle my stomach. Uh, a little hair of the dog, Mister. Unlikely. We'll just keep this ship afloat, Lieutenant. Off we go. <laughs> Tune in next time for another thrilling episode of The Incompetent Lieutenant. Brought to you by Ivory Soap. Because cleanliness is next to godliness. The King Cake Caper by Susan Muchmore. The characters are the announcer, played by Susan, a New Orleans native who loves carnival. She's an enthusiastic champion of everything Mardi Gras. Officer Supervision, played by Catherine, a fast-talking, no-nonsense beat cop, one of the first women on the New Orleans Police Department. Her success in napping crooks is legendary. Say the word, played by Sue. Officer Supervision's right-hand partner, also a beat cop. She is one of the good cops in the team. Captain Desperada, also known as Des, played by Thomas. The New Orleans Police Department captain. He is not crazy about women in the force. Ella Veda, played by Anita, a baker of king cakes. She's a large woman who always seems to have flour in her hair. She has a booming voice, but a soft manner. Detective Ray Diedo, played by Craig, a police detective. He's in his 50s, has a beer belly, and a large family. His bark is bigger than his bite. <laughs> Blanche Dubois, played by Lisa. I'm a quirky journalist that sometimes works for the New Orleans Police Department on crime scenes. She is dressed in a oversized blue police coat, green striped tights, and several strands of Mardi Gras beads. See, she wants to go unnoticed in the crowd. Mardi Gras Reveler, played by Eric, enthusiastic participant of the Mardi Gras scene, dancing, playing music, and throwing beats. Mr. Good Times. It is late Tuesday in February 1952. In New Orleans, it is the last day of Carnival, which is dubbed Fat Tuesday. It's a day the city lets loose, celebrating before Ash Wednesday and Lent. 
The air is usually humid and the temperature is warmer than usual. You can smell the olive trees lining Esplanade Avenue and the air is heavy with scents of people cooking and barbecuing. At midnight, the party will be over and the cops on horsebacks will clear the streets. But today, Canal Street is lined with costume revelers waiting for the Rex Parade. These streets are crowded with costumed families and parade goers stumbling their way to Canal Street to catch the parade. Police Detective Radiator and Captain Desperata are assigned to the quarter, away from the parades. Hey, Captain, I'm fishing to go up Royal and see if I can get into some trouble. All right. Keep your radio on in case you find some. Ray makes his way over to Royal Street. He shoulders through the crowd, dodging strands of beads thrown by costumes revelers leaning over their balconies. Hey, Ray, come on up and have a beer. No, maybe later. I'm on duty. Y'all behave yourselves now. A family of six, dressed in red polka dot clown suits, crosses in front of him. Ray leans down to put a strand of beads on the baby stroller. He straightens her pointy hat and wishes the family a happy Mardi Gras. Happy Mardi Gras, y'all! Ray sees his favorite bakery, Ella's. The purveyor of king cakes is open and he goes in to buy one. King cake's a traditional cake made of braided dough and covered in the colors of Mardi Gras, green for faith, gold for powder, and purple for justice. New Orleanians look forward to the annual baking of the cakes, which begins on Epiphany. Tradition has it that the cakes are baked with a small trinket, usually a plastic baby inside waiting for the first person to find it. That person's dubbed the king or the queen for the day and must bring a king cake to the next gathering. This continues until Mardi Gras day. He enters the bakery to find it disheveled and empty. He gets on the radio and calls for his captain who's around the corner. Captain, Captain, get over to Ellis Tip Suite. There's been a robbery. Come on my way. Hey, what do we have here? Looks like somebody tossed the place. Go into the kitchen, see if anybody's hiding in there. Take your revolver. Someone's here. It's Miss Ella. She's been robbed. We're coming out. Uh, nobody else is here. Ella comes out with Des. She has more flour in her hair than usual and is wheeling a heavy arm bacon pan by her side. Miss Ella, what happened? I was just closing up when this scruffy guy comes in. He had his hands in his pockets and he told me he had a gun. She said to give him the money in the cash draw, so I did. Then he did the strangest thing. He seen that there was a dozen king cakes in the display case. He told me to box them up. While I was doing that, he went to, back into the storeroom. He left the door open so he could watch me. He also had locked the front door so nobody could come in. He walked out of the storeroom with the last, with the last three bottles of my best Cajun whiskey, juggling the boxes of king cakes, and he ran out the back door. Captain, I think I have the vapors. I need to sit down. Ray takes out his notebook and starts asking Ella questions. Have you ever seen him before? I've seen him walking around most days looking like a bum he is. I could smell him when he came in. What was he wearing? You know, he usually has some on grimy green shirts and dungarees, but today he had on a clown suit. A red polka dot? A red polka dot and a pointy hat? Yep, nice costume for a bum. Okay, you live upstairs, right? Go on up and have something to drink. We'll be in touch. Okay, but you know that drink? I don't have any whiskey left. This job sounds like a job for officers' supervision and Sadie Ward. Ray, get him on the radio. Officer Sue, there's been a robbery over on Royal. It's at Miss Ellis Bakery. Yeah, the one on Royal. You and Sandy need to get over here. 
and bring Blanche along with you. Blanche arrives first and starts taking photos of the front of the bakery. She can see through the window that the cake display counters are empty. A wobbly horse comes careening down the sidewalk. Oh, dang, I so wanted a king cake. They're all out of king cakes all over the city, and this place was my last hope. I see the department didn't have the spare horses on this here case. <laughs> well, bless your heart, Captain. I'm shocked you didn't run the vermin down yourself. I, I just figured you and Sue were undercover today due to your choice of attire and hey, y'all would like the color uh, the arrest the women were wearing a gray spotted horse suit sue was the head while sadie was the back end blanche was the groom and sue had taken her horse head off and sadie was sitting down very funny we were out in front of the station dancing with the kids when you call oh it's sure hot in that there costume. You got any clothes on under there? <laughs> Why, Captain Desparate, what would your poor wife say? <laughs> Never mind. Blanche, help us get out of this here horse suit. Wait, no, I hadn't taken your pictures yet. You put that head back on. I've been getting some good photos today. Haven't seen any crime except for this one. I was just finishing uh, shooting up the cutest little family of clowns. <laughs> hey, Blanche, send me a print of that, would you? Pointy hats and red polka dot suits? Yeah, how did you know? Did you see them? Oh, weren't they darling? That family of five was, uh, I think, just on, on, on their way to Jackson Square. As a matter of fact, I did. I planned a string of bees on the baby. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, family five? I saw six. <laughs> no, no, only five clowns. Um, I thought it was funny that their father wasn't, uh, and, he, and he was uh, pushing the stroller. Sue puts on her head and Sadie stands up. Oh, wait a minute, I'm the groom, remember. I need, you, I need to lead you to wherever it is you wanna go. Oh, where are we going anyway? To find Joe King, Ray fingered him by Miss Ellie's description. Everyone knows Joe. Come on, let's hit the sidewalk and find this criminal. Blanche, you lead the way. Des and Ray, you follow. I think I might know where he is. Lee, throw me something, mister. I'll trade you a beer for those beads. Sounds of glasses and loud voices are heard as they walk through the open door. Ruby! Rome is Ray a and Des find seats at the bar and order knit whiskey neat. Come on, please, not in there. Never thought I'd have to follow the back of a horse to find a safe. <laughs> <laughs> Just then, the horse walks into the Gunga Den bar. He slides up to the bar and orders a beer. Bar to tender doesn't skip a beat and slides the beer down to the horse. Hey, why the long face? Hey, over there, by the jukebox, there's a clown in a red polka-dotted suit with a pointy hat. And look, everyone's in kinky. I think we got our man. The horse, Blanche, Ray, and Des walk over to the clown. Put that king cake down. You're under arrest for the robbery of Miss Ella's bakery. You are charged with impersonating a clown and the theft of cash and whiskey. Don't forget the most serious charge, grand larceny for stealing king cakes and on Mardi Gras day. You should be ashamed of yourself dressed like that. Wipe that icing off of your face and put your sticky hands behind your back. Looking, Des. 
Braid, Des, Sadie, and Sue put Joe into a squad car bound for central lockup. The clown suit is returned to the grateful family who had reported the theft of the costume. As midnight approaches, Ray, Des, Blanche, Sadie, and Sue wander into the Coliseum where the meeting of two kings of carnival, King Rex and King Comus, will take place. It's a big deal with the ladies in formal gowns and gentlemen in tuxedos, both wearing elaborately decorated masks. They attend various balls which culminate with the two kings raising their glasses in a final toast to the carnival season. Five of the New Orleans finest will join in the toast, taking their final sips of whiskey as the city prepares to exercise 40 days of self-denial. Another carnival is under their belts, and the king cakes are safe. For now, there are thousands of stories in the Crescent City, and this is just one of them. Little Orphan Annie, Annie Returns to the Orphanage, presented by Ovaltine, by Catherine Close. The characters are the announcer, played by Anita. Narrator, played by Thomas. Little Orphan Annie, resourceful, resilient, courageous 10-year-old orphan, played by Lisa. Oliver Daddy Warbucks, a former small machine shop owner, acquired great wealth producing munitions during World War I. He's gregarious, forceful, and very fond of Annie, played by Craig. Mrs. Warbucks, a snobbish, stern, small-minded, selfish woman who's embarrassed by both her husband and Annie, played by Susan. Hook, a friendly, loving Irish immigrant who strongly dislikes Mrs. Warbucks, played by Catherine. Miss Treat headmistress of the dreary orphanage where Mrs. Warbucks originally found Annie and brought her home on a trial basis. Miss Treat is cold and sarcastic, frequently abusing Annie, played by Sue. Jimmy, a sniveling, lying 10-year-old orphan who Miss Treat manipulates to his advantage, played by Eric. like to be like little orphan Annie boys and girls. Well, here's one way to make it happen. If you've been listening to our show, you know drinking Ovaltine gives you pep like Annie. So do Annie a favor and tell your mother to add Ovaltine to her shopping list. Now it's time for another of Andy's adventures, and it's a corker, boys and girls. But first, I want to mention a surprise brought to you by our sponsor, Ovaltine. Yes, sir, it's the most thrilling opportunity ever presented over the radio. Have a pencil and paper handy after the show so you won't miss a word about the big surprise. And now, on to Annie's big adventure. In the kitchen of Daddy Warbuck's mansion, Cook is preparing breakfast while slipping treats to Annie and her dog, Sandy. The previous evening, Cook stayed up late after serving an evening meal 
to guests at the Warbucks dinner party. Now, Anna, you sit yourself down and dig into this breakfast, darling. Gee, Whiskers, you're the best cook in the whole wide world. Isn't she, Sandy? Arf, arf, arf. <laughs> we <laughs> need to put a little meat on your bones after the way they starved you at that horrible orphanage. Miss Treat always said I should be very grateful for my daily mush. Hmm. Did she now? Mrs. Warbucks enters the kitchen through a swing door. She is frowning. What is that filthy dog doing in the kitchen? His name is Sandy. Annie throws her arms protectively around Sandy. I asked you a question. It's raining cats and dogs, ma'am. Then he won't lack for company. Mrs. Warbucks gingerly picks up Sandy by his scruff and tosses him out the back door. Don't get above your station, Cook. Now, Annie, go upstairs and wash yourself. Tame that mop on your head and put on a nice dress. I purchased for you. I had hoped you'd make a good impression on our guests last night, and you did not. You and I are taking a little trip in the car today. Where are we going, Mrs. Warbucks? Don't be impertinent. Had I wanted you to know, I would have told you. Annie leaves the kitchen and goes upstairs to change. A few minutes later, Annie comes skipping down the enormous staircase. At the bottom is Daddy Warbucks, holding Sandy. Mrs. Warbucks stands impatiently nearby. Look what I found scratching at the door. Arf, arf. We don't need that mongrel inside dripping all over the carpet. We're a nation of mongrels and proud of it. I say Sandy's pedigree is as impressive as ours, my dear. Horse feathers. I just can't seem to better this family. Annie, you little ray of sunshine, your daddy has to go away on a business trip. Will you miss me? Oh, gosh, oh, hemlock, will I ever. Well, I'll miss you as much as I'd miss Sandy if he went away on a on a business trip, Daddy Warbucks. <laughs> well, I hope Sandy never has to take a business trip, little Annie. I'll be back before you know it. Having fun? You two were a regular vaudeville, vaude, vaudeville routine at my dinner party last night. <laughs> Would you like an encore, my dear? No. Now, hurry or you'll miss your train. Annie, give your daddy a big kiss. Annie and Sandy run to embrace him. He departs. Mrs. Warbucks stands in the foyer and listens as Daddy Warbucks's car drives off into the distance. Come along, Annie. We have a long car ride ahead of us. Come along, Sandy. We have a long car ride ahead of us. That animal is not riding in my car. You may leave him here. Oh, please, Mrs. Warbucks. Sandy will be very sad without me. Do not beg. It's unattractive. And don't say, aw, oh, it makes you sound like a gutter snipe. Book has her ear to the door and hears the entire exchange. Oh, I'd like to make her nibs do some begging for a change, I would. Ooh, I'd make her beg on her knees, wouldn't I? Annie has fallen asleep during the car ride. Now she sleepily rubs her eyes and sits up to gather her wits. After a moment, she gazes out at a large, dreary, but familiar-looking building. Annie, wake up. We're here. Holy alligator! Why are we back at the orphanage? 
I never wanted to see this place again. Annie, I told you you were here on a trial basis. That trial has come to an end. Is it because Daddy Warbucks and I sang last night at your dinner party? You embarrassed me, yes, but it isn't only that. You just don't fit into our world, Annie. Uh, don't you mean just your world? Because I know that Daddy Warbucks loves me. He'll get over it. Miss Treat, the headmistress, has walked out to greet Mrs. Warbucks and Annie. Come along, Annie. We have your bed prepared. Your old friends are excited that you've returned to us. Old friends? Isn't that nice, Annie? Goodbye and good luck. Thank you for your help in this matter, Miss Street. Of course, Mrs. Warbucks. Good day to you. Follow me, Annie. <laughs> Miss Annie and Treat and Annie walk into the huge, decrepit building that is even more depressing on the inside. The peeling point has faded to a dull gray. The orphans are lined up, waiting to eat. No one smiles. You may get in line, Annie. It's mush today, and it will be left over mush tomorrow. A few children earned ice cream, but you're not one. After dinner, start scrubbing the floor. You should be grateful. You're a lucky orphan who had a chance with that lovely family. Yes, Mrs. Treat. Annie sits in the big dining hall and eats a bowl of mush. Ten-year-old Jimmy walks up with an ice cream cone and taunts her. Annie Banani sitting on her fanny, eating her bowl of mush. Annie Banani sitting on her fanny. Gosh, does she need a hairbrush? Leave me alone, Jimmy. I miss Chase's favor, Annie. You're never going to get an ice cream, never. Leaping lizards. It's bad enough here without having to put up with you, too, Jimmy. Annie, Annie dumps her bowl of mush onto Jimmy's head. Jimmy bawls loudly. Hey, wow. Annie, for your hard behavior, you will now scrub the upstairs floors and then go to bed without any supper. Now go. Annie finishes her chores, then shivers in bed under a thin blanket. Annie is nearly asleep when she hears a tapping at the window. She pulls the curtain to see Daddy Warbucks holding her dog, Sandy. She opens the window. Oh, gee whiskers, Daddy Warbucks, I don't know which one of you I am happier to see. Annie, I didn't want you to miss another, us another minute. That's why I brought Sandy now. What do you say you climb out this window and make a great escape? Golly, won't I get into trouble with Mrs. Treat? Don't you worry about Miss Treat, Annie. She and Mrs. Warbucks are better, had better worry about being in trouble with me. Annie climbs out the window and into Daddy Warbucks' arms. He sets her down, and together they and Sandy walk towards his car. How did you know I was here? We have an ally in Cook, Annie. I gave her the numbers of all the hotels where I'd be staying. She suspected that Mrs. Warbucks was up to and notified me. Mrs. Warbucks is a good wife, Annie, but she needs improvement as a mother. We must be patient with her. Can you help me with that? Oh, you can count on me, Daddy Warbucks, and Sandy, too. <laughs> Wasn't that a thrilling adventure, boys and girls? Now here's the big surprise. We're going to give everyone a chance to get the lyrics to the Little Orphan Annie theme song so you can sing along with us every week. The printed lyrics come with your name, 
signed by Annie herself. You can't buy these lyrics in a store. They've been created just for boys and girls who drink their Ovaltine. All you have to do is to print your name and address on a piece of paper and mail it with a nickel and one aluminum seal from under the lid of an Ovaltine can to Little Orphan Annie, Chicago, Illinois. That's it. Join us tomorrow, boys and girls, for another adventure from Little Orphan Nanny. The little cheddar box, the young pretty auburn box. Whom do you see? It's Little Orphan Nanny.